welcome back. So, um, last week for the course, um, where we look at remedies, which is something we didn't look at in that much detail over the course of the term, the main thing is we'll see, um, and as we saw, in fact, is the typical remedy, which is to quash a decision and return it to the decision maker. And you have a bunch of alternative remedies, which is an exhaustive list that you have in the chapter for this week, um, most of which are actually available before the federal court. So usually the stains, some of them can be ordered by the superior courts, but usually the place where you have the entire menu available and where these things actually um, happen to be ordered some of the time is before the federal court. Before we get into that, we'll um, talk a little bit about the housing case, which we um, didn't cover last week. So you'll recall everything about the appellate standard of review. I won't repeat it again, because um, I think I already covered that twice. Um, but there is a different standard that applies to the extent that you have the word appeal in the statute and to the extent that that is framed positively. So if it says you have a right of appeal, doesn't use the word appeal in some other way, right? Like final and without appeal. It's not proper use the word appeal. So if it says you have a right of appeal, then the, the general standard framework, the general framework that we have of reasonableness and correctness review does not apply and you are subject to a different framework, which is the appellate standard, which is the standard that otherwise applies when a court of appeal is reviewing a decision of an inferior court. And that standard is different in that it's not subject to the presumption of reasonableness review. So under that standard, you have um, issues of fact and mixed fact in law, which are both reviewed pursuant to a more deferential standard, which is a palpable and overriding error. It is not the same as reasonableness review. It is arguably more interventionist. Nonetheless, it's similar in that you have deference. And for issues of law under the housing framework, these are reviewable under um, a standard of correctness, and that's where the difference is, because under, um, under administrative law, even issues of law are reviewed based on a deferential standard of review, which is reasonableness. So this is different, right, in that all issues of law under the housing framework are subject to correctness review. Therefore, it's significantly more interventionist globally as a framework than the one that you have under administrative law. Um, so that's how the, the standard um, differs under administrative law, you'll recall on top of that, most issues of law would in fact actually be subject to reasonableness review because most of them would first not be issues of central importance to the legal system as a whole, which is the one exception that you have. And on top of that, most of them would be the decision maker interpreting their home statute so their constitutive statute, which gives them their powers, right? And that is subject to a greater, right? An, an, an additional presumption that deference should apply because they have a specific expertise in, in interpreting the law that they happen to be applying all day. Under the housing framework, to the extent that you have something that's subject to correctness review, it can be replaced. That is different from, in terms of remedies, quote unquote, right, different from what you have pursuant to administrative law. So in administrative law, of course, correctness means the same thing. It's reviewed the same way. The decision maker is free to replace the decision with their own. But under administrative law, they don't. So they know what the answer is because it's correctness. That's the nature of it, right? There's a single answer. If you determine that it's not the correct one, it's because you've also determined what is the correct one. However, under administrative law, nonetheless, you don't get to, by default, amend the decision and render the decision that ought to have been rendered, although you know what it is. In contrast, courts of appeal routinely replace the decision of the lower instance court with the one that they determine ought to have been made 
pursuant to a standard of correctness. It's generally because, right, um, it, it doesn't require a further assessment by a lower instance court, which has all the advantages that you saw in the housing case, a greater familiarity with the record, with the witnesses, right, it's been able to assess for credibility. All that is not really material to an issue of law. So if this, the, the superior court erred in applying the correct law, right, the facts remain the same, the factual conclusions of the lower instance court also remain the same. The only thing that changes is the way in which these lead to a legal result, which the Court of Appeal can determine on its own because right, the ingredients are essentially the same. So the other standard that under Housing, as we said, is palpable and overriding error. Um, that means that um, you, you have the description of that in the case. Um, it, it, it applies to both um, issues of fact and issues of mixed fact and law. What's that mean, right? Well, you have the example of negligence there, determining what the test is for negligence. That is a legal issue. That's what the law is, right? So the law says, it could be a piece of legislation or common law, it doesn't matter, right? It says you've got to have one, two, and three to prove negligence. That's the law. If the judge errs in doing that, that's an error of law. Then, an issue of fact might be, right, was the guy drunk that night? That's an issue of fact. So, someone says something, someone else says something else, and then the judge magically decide what the truth is, what actually did happen, that's determination of fact. He was drunk at night, that's how much he drank. Then when you combine the two, that's where you have an issue of mixed fact in law. So in determining whether the fact that he was drunk, right, determination of fact, constitutes negligence pursuant to the test issue of law, that is an issue of mixed fact in law, essentially the application of a legal standard to a set of specific factual circumstances. Of course, right, doesn't make a difference because if it's not an issue of law, it's reviewed upon the same standard, unless you have what the case mentions as an, an inextric, inextricable, sorry, legal principle. What's that mean? Well, it means that you're able to isolate the error as being one as to, for example, the standard or one of the steps, in which case it becomes an issue of law because it's about the law, it's about the test, and because you can extricate it, you can split it from the rest of the decision, and then it's no longer mixed fact and law because you stopped mixing the facts with it. Okay, so appellate courts on top of that on determinations of law, first, as we said, do not have a disadvantaged position as compared to the trial judge because they keep the facts being the same and just apply the law as it ought to have been determined by the trial judge. On top of that, why is it that they intervene? First, generally, they're thought to have greater expertise. Usually, they're smarter judges. That's why you pick them from the superior court to get there. Um, and also, they deal with issues of law all day, right? So judges of the superior court will spend their days deciding what happened, whether he was drunk, whereas judges at the court of appeal spend their days determining what the law is or ought to be, right, ought to have been interpreted as, and therefore they have a specialized expertise in doing that, which legitimates their intervention, and there's also a concern in uniformity, which flows from that, from their expertise, and from the fact that they have supervisory power over all the judges, and therefore, right, we want them to ensure that the law is applied consistently and that legal answers are not different depending on the lower instance judge. And of course, it also means that once the Court of Appeal makes a determination of law, if there's a conflict or an error, then that determination by virtue of stare decisis will apply to all of the lower instance court, so it solves that problem. Okay, so um, chapter on remedies for this week, right? 
that's it for the housing case. Um, first, the default remedy, as we have discussed throughout the semester, is to quash the decision and return it to the decision maker for redetermination. So it is to cancel the decision. Again, regardless of the standard of review, you've got to go through all the steps, you decide what it is, then you apply it, the standard, then it turns out to have been either incorrect or unreasonable that does not make difference. The remedy is the same by default, and that is to quash the decision, namely cancel it, and send it back to the decision maker for redetermination. As we have said, that will generally mean, mean a different actual physical person as a decision maker for obvious reasons that we covered. Nonetheless, the court almost never will substitute its own opinion for that of the decision maker, even when it knows the answer, right, as it always does under correctness, because we have deference. Because, right, the whole point of this thing is that the decision maker is supposed to have uh, specialized expertise, supposed to be able to make decisions more efficiently. All that is defeated by an overly interventionist stance by the courts, even though at first it might seem easier and cheaper for them to just say what the correct answer ought to have been, right, and, and avoid the, the, we call it merry-go-round, right, sending it down and the whole thing happening again. But at the end of the day, right, if the court always does that, that will mean that people will go to court even more often and try to have the court determine it, which would defeat the entire purpose, including the fact that the decision maker is supposed to have, right, a more efficient process and also specialized expertise and all the things that we saw. Okay, for the reasons that we mentioned at the beginning of the semester, of course, you don't have a statutory or constitutional right of appeal. You have an inherent right to seek judicial review by virtue of the Constitution. That's why the courts, right, generally superior court for reasons that we saw, has retained its supervisory jurisdiction, regardless of other things like the way in which the government has phrased your lack of a right to seek judicial review. So it can be severely limited, but it can't be abrogated entirely for reasons that we saw, at least not in all cases. Okay, another thing that we did not see is that a lot of these um, remedies are essentially equitable remedies, right? Um, which means that the court can deny them if it doesn't want to give it them. So um, that's especially true for um, the enumerated, well, sorry, you see my handwriting didn't get any better this term. Um, so uh, this is especially true of the enumerated remedies that you have in chapter 9. They count as essentially equitable. That means that the court is able to deny these remedies, right? That's because historically, as you are mentioned, right, the king made it up to supplement justice, blah, 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 right? We saw that in first year. So equitable, which means that it can be denied for reasons that are not directly related to the legal claim. Because these remedies are supposed to help justice, right? When the law did not adequately serve justice, it's what equity is, then you have to respect these principles. The main thing is what we call the clean hands doctrine, which means if you did something wrong for any reason, you're not showing up with clean hands, the court can deny one of the remedies that you have enumerated in the chapter. So the court can say, yes, that was an illegal decision. Yes, you are, per the statute, entitled to whatever it is, mandamus. But, right, you've done something wrong, somehow it's not necessarily directly related to what you're asking for, and we will choose to deny the remedy that you're asking for because these remedies are equitable, quote-unquote, essentially. They are discretionary. 
Okay, then you have um, uh, the doctrine of exhaustion of remedies, which we never discuss really throughout the term, but which is um, especially important. Um, so, it says that you have to exhaust your remedies within the administrative system before you show up to a court. Of course, the point of that is all the things we said, right? It, it's supposed to be che cheaper, simpler, more effective, more specialized. Well, we want you to avail yourself of that option instead of going to courts. So you won't get to go to court instead of going to an administrative decision maker, of course, right? Um, but also, you won't get to go to court to seek judicial review even after you showed up before an administrative decision maker if you have not fully exhausted your statutory remedies. What does that mean? Well, it means um, you might have a right of reconsideration, which is extremely weird, but not unusual. So, of course, you don't have that with the courts, right? 99% of the time, you don't get to show up to the judge after the decision's been rendered or the proceedings have ended and say, we want you to reopen the case so that we can argue further arguments. Usually it's not worked that way. It's not true under administrative law. You might have a right to reopen the proceedings precisely in the way I just mentioned. You might have a right to reconsideration, which we see even more often. And of course, again, all that would be provided for under the statute, right? So this is, none of this is inherent. None of this is constitutional. By default, it's what the statute says, of course, right? Because say the statute doesn't say the car tribunal. Well, for sure, the constitution doesn't. Right? Constitution says superior court. So the place where you have to go, the modalities of the way in which you go there are provided for in the statute. Same thing for this, right? If you have remedies available within the administrative system, they are also provided for by statute. So one of the more common ones is reconsideration. So you might get to not reopen the proceedings in the way I've just described but you might get to ask the decision maker to rethink your stuff themselves. You might say, this appears to be wrong in law. Hey, immigration officer, it appears that you have ignored the law. Would you be kind enough to rethink your decision? And they will say yes or no. Then if they say yes, I'll do it. And then you'll get a decision upon your reconsideration request where I'll say, I looked at the law, I decided not to do anything. It's often provided for. Different from reopening the proceedings in that there's no new arguments and different from an appeal or review within the administrative system, which you also have to exhaust for the same reasons. If there's an appeal tribunal provided for by statute, you go there before the superior court, right? So, and, and reconsideration is different from that in that um, it's the same decision maker that reviews their own decision as opposed to another one reviewing their decision. Okay, so that is the default remedy. Um, again, 99% um, of the time you'll have the, the, the decision quashed and returned to the decision maker. Um, similarly, you have the doctrine of fungus officio, which is exactly what I see it. So the doctrine of functus officio says once a decision maker has exercised their role, they no longer have jurisdiction. So if you are before a court, the court renders a decision, it is functus officio. It had the power to decide the case by law, just pick power, do whatever they want, right? Order some. Um, but that power ends with them deciding the case, which is the judgment. So if you call them up afterwards, right, all that cool power that they had, they no longer have because they are functus officio. They have ended their office and can no longer exercise that power. Well, the corollary of that is if they're not, they're not, right? They're not done. They have the power. And so you should exhaust that pursuant to the doctrine of exhaustion of remedies prior to showing up before an actual court to seek judicial review.
Okay, you have two exceptions to that, which are quite obvious, I think. Um, so, to the extent that there is essentially a typographical error or an error that everyone agrees with that's a bit more substantive, then a decision maker can correct their decision as opposed to reopen it. Um, another thing that we, um, that we mentioned earlier in the term, um, which is a corollary of that, um, is that you, of course, cannot generally raise a new argument upon judicial review because same thing as an appeal, really, right? The whole point is that first you got your chance, and which, 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 at which point, sorry, you were expected to raise the arguments and the stuff that you wanted decided upon, like the evidence, right? Therefore, upon appeal, like upon judicial review, you generally cannot raise new arguments or new evidence. Okay, we'll do some erasing now. Um, so again, as I said, this is 90% of the time, right? You're going to have quashing the decision and return it. Nonetheless, you have additional powers, which we call prerogative powers, which were essentially powers that emanated from the divine power of the king for reasons that we saw kind of similar to equity, right? Um, and therefore were by nature discretionary. They remain today. The main context, as I said, is the Federal Courts Act, which specifically provides for the power of the Federal Court to order these things. You can still seek them before the Superior Court, but they are more often and more numerous um, before um, the Federal Courts. It's the, the general context um, where that will apply, and the main ones will be um, the, the, the main one will be what we call mandamus, which is extremely unusual still, but where you have the merry-go-round, right? So where you have um, where, where you have um, a, a decision being made, then up to a court being quashed, and it goes down, then it's made wrong again, and on and on and on. Usually has to be long, right? Long like 14 years, not like two. Um, and, and then the court might order a decision to be made. Mandamus, similarly, when you have um, a, a decision maker who simply refuses to act, um, and you keep again, right, they, they say no, you go up, they say cancel, they say no again, right, at some point the court will have to take um, notice of the fact that repeatedly it appears that the power does not want to be exercised, and therefore will order that the power be exercised. Okay, and these apply to um, public actors, like most of administrative law, but slightly more specific. It's also why, of course, they happen a lot before the federal court, because as we said, the federal court has jurisdiction over the government, right? It has jurisdiction over the federal government, so does a lot of public law stuff, including right, ministers and all of that. First remedy that you have, there's five total, as is mentioned, right? Certiorari is where, extremely, extremely unusual, probably the second most unusual, is where you get to order a decision maker to be reviewed. So you order them to show up with the record, and they do so, and the court determines whether something has been done in violation of generally having something having to do with procedural fairness. Um, that being said, doesn't change the stuff that we saw earlier. There's no early judicial review. You have to exhaust your remedies, and that also means you don't get to have review of an interim decision. So, for example, you're before a court, a judge, whatever, right, rejects some evidence. That you can seek permission, might not have a right by law to appeal, so permission to appeal, which generally will be denied, but you can do that. You're allowed, by law, not under judicial review. There's no way for an interim decision and you showing up before the federal court and say, or whatever court, right, and saying, this is wrong, can you fix it or cancel it such that the rest of the proceedings go right. Doesn't happen because you haven't exhausted again the remedies, right? Namely, to first raise it before the decision maker and then wait for a decision on the merits, which might very well fix the problem anyway. 
Okay, another thing that's mentioned here is a, is a side note not related to these um, remedies, but which we never explicitly mention is that you do not get money in administrative law, or at least before the course, you do not get money. Generally, under administrative law, you don't get money at all, right? Generally, it's about you getting your license or whatever. Sometimes you'll get compensation when it's provided by law, but not that often. That being said, before the course, upon judicial review, you essentially never get money. Doesn't work that way. What the court does is review, but then the remedy is, unlike a court, never to give you money. That's what courts do usually, right? It's money or jail. Um, doesn't give you money. It cancels the decision. So although a, an illegal decision was just made to your prejudice, because it's illegal, there's no compensation for that. It's a cancelled return, and therefore, upon judicial review, you almost never have monetary awards. Second one is mandamus, as I said, some, probably the most common one, especially before the federal court, um, and that happens when systematically a public servant refuses to act, and you have the specific criteria um, at pages um, 590, usually requires a risk, something special, right? So some risk that shorter rights will be infringed or a very vulnerable person will be prejudiced. So a, a specific unusual risk, otherwise the court refers to, again, quash and return, then to order a, 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 a person to do something. 590, you have the criteria. Um, so there has to be a duty owed, so you can ask for something, it's owed to you. There's like 20 criteria out there, but we'll get through the main ones, 590 again, um, right? Duty owed to you, you ask for the duty to be performed, and, and each of these is cumulative. It's declined, it's declined wrongly, and then you have certain criteria having to do with a balance of convenience which is essentially drawn from, if that's of any interest to you, a precedent called RJR on preliminary injunctions. And it's a very similar test as to whether or not it's worth it for the court, given the balance of the interests involved, to order mandamus. Usually, as I said, the underlying um, objective of that is to avoid undue delay. So when it becomes very clear that what you're asking for and have a right to will not happen, although the court right, keeps asking for it in other ways. Doesn't need to be, right? For instance, charter rights might be more permissively ordered, but usually that's the typical way in which it shows up. Okay, writ of prohibition is the exact same thing, but the opposite. So it's when the decision maker, so mandamus was they are supposed to do something, they systematically refuse to do it. So the court says, I am ordering you to do it. And it gets pretty cool, right? They order ministers to do stuff, although they're unelected, it happens sometimes. Uh, prohibition is the opposite. They keep doing a thing that they're not supposed to do, that the court has said they're not supposed to do. So the court will do the opposite. It will say, I am prohibiting you from keeping on doing, again, same underlying rationale, want to avoid undue delay, right, will prevent you from doing what you keep doing, which I told you repeatedly not to do because it's illegal. And again, same kind of framework. The court orders specifically, right, an executive agent to, do, to not do something. Then you have avis corpus, which we won't um, get into, um, but it's a similar remedy, right? So first it's alternative to, um, to quash and return. Um, it applies, of course, in the criminal law, right? That's one of your constitutional rights, in fact. So someone, whoever it is, usually, I mean, it always is the government in some way, right? But usually as the police, could be something else. That's why administrative law shows up. You can have administrative detention of someone who has first not been found to have committed a criminal act, but someone who turns out to be not someone who has rights in Canada. 
because of their legal status, they don't have constitutional rights, and so you can detain them if you want to. It ends up being administrative law, generally, in the, in the, in the immigration context. There's a bunch of other things with hospitals, disabled people, all sorts of things. So, shows up in the criminal law, the police detains you, and you disagree, right? So, usually the way it works, the police arrests you, then they free you. That's how it works, because you're not guilty yet, they don't get to jail you. Sometimes, unusually, they will preliminarily detain you in case you right, are likely to kill someone else or get on your private plane and leave. If they do that, you have a right to say, bring me before a judge. So you have a right to say, I want this deprivation of my freedom, which again is not legal in that you're not guilty yet, right? Um, it's provided for by some other law, you, you get to say, bring me before a judge, or I will say that I ought not to be detained. And that's one of your rights, that habeas corpus, that's the bring me before a judge part. And the judge will usually order what is least depriving of one's freedom, for the reasons that we saw, right? Um, because right, same, same underlying rationale as you free people before um, before they before their trial if you think they've committed a crime, again can happen in the administrative context. We won't get into the specifics of it, but there are two um, specific um, issues that are uh, that make it different from the other remedies that we saw. First, habeas corpus is a right; it is not a discretionary remedy, unlike everything else. So everything else we said is equitable, clean hands, so that the court can deny them to the extent the court thinks you've done something wrong for any reason that need not be related to what the legal claim is. In contrast, habeas corpus is a right. It's not discretionary. So you have a right to ask for it, and you have a right for the court to rule upon it and to order it if it's appropriate, of course, of course, the court will weigh whether it's appropriate. It's not a discretionary exercise, right? It's the nature of adjudication. But once it determines that something applies, right? So usually will mean that the decision to jail you is invalid and is canceled. Um, so if it's preliminary detention before your trial, you'll be free. Usually shows up in a bit more nuanced context, right? So they transfer you to a higher security prison. There is no adequate justification for that. That's a deprivation of freedom in that you are further deprived of your freedom than you originally were. And so the court will order that you be, that that decision essentially be canceled. So it's a right, and it's different in that the burden shifts. So you've got two steps. The first step is to show a deprivation of freedom, which as you can imagine will not be particularly hard, right? Because you happen to be in jail. Um, and then the burden shifts. And so it's no longer for you to argue that this is an illegitimate or inappropriate deprivation of your freedom. It is for the government, the counterparty, to show the opposite. So by default, once you show a deprivation of freedom, you are you have a right for that not to happen, for it to essentially be canceled, um, as we said, unless the counterparty who now has the burden, right, shows otherwise, shows that it's a reasonable and appropriate um, deprivation of your freedom. Okay, last one very briefly is quo warranto, um, basically of absolutely no relevance, um, but it's about someone essentially gaining elected office illegally. And you can have the courts exercise essentially an equitable remedy to, to solve the problem. Um, doesn't happen all that often precisely because there are statutory remedies, right? One of the reasons why we're a developed country is that, right, if, if someone turns out to have been elected wrong, there are a lot of remedies you can exercise for that not to keep happening, right? Um, nonetheless, there are specific situations usually having to do with 
um, First Nations Council elections, which, um, not to make any inappropriate comments, but usually are extremely contested um, because usually there are quite significant salaries associated with elected positions um, in First Nations Council, which are, which are funded by the government. Um, and usually you have um, lots of people who want to get elected there. And usually that lends itself sometimes to some procedural irregularities with financing and all of that. Um, that is, first, there's sometimes or often fewer statutory remedies because it's more specific and local, right? It's not the federal election. Um, and that is within the jurisdiction of the federal court on certain issues of indigenous law. And so the, the federal court, right, um, will review that. And that's basically the context where it would be, um, where it would be ordered, right? Where you'd have that remedy. But again, right, um, that's only to the extent that you have first um, no um, statutory remedy. But it can also be that the court finds, because again, we're back to discretionary now, unlike habeas corpus, the court might also find that some other remedy is more appropriate, namely quash the decision, right? So the court could, could, could invalidate the election and order that it be held again, instead of having to exercise, right, a discretionary remedy to essentially remove someone from office um, forcefully. So that's what, um, what, that's what it is. Um, it concludes our discussion of the five prerogatives powers. Um, one of the things that's mentioned at the end of the chapter, um, if that was ever of any confusion, is that you no longer need to ask for those separately. So initially, because of their discretionary nature, you had to request them separately. That's no longer the case. So What's that mean? Well, you can go before the federal court, you can say this decision is unreasonable and I want certiorari because I meet, or mandamus because I meet the criteria. I want the court to order um, that decision be made um, for the decision maker essentially with an order. However, you know you'll lose because of the nature of the stringent criteria. So you'll also say, right, the subsidiary argument that you want the decision to simply be quashed and returned. So that means that you can ask for various remedies, including these ones, in the same essentially lawsuit, in the same application for judicial review. And that concludes our material for this course.